Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. We are continuing our coverage of HFES 2018. My name is Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. We're also joined today by Tammy Griffith, who is the chief engineer for the U.S. Army in the Simulation Training and Technology Center. And today we're going to be talking about who Tammy is and uh, her panel on preventing violence in schools and seeing if human factors and ergonomics profession has a role in this. So, Tammy, thank you. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Uh, Thank you. We're glad to have you. Um, So I want to start off by kind of asking you, to kind of go over some of your background and, and kind of let our listeners know who we're talking to right now. Okay. My name is Tammy Griffith, as you mentioned, Nick, and um, I work for the U.S. Army. My background is in modeling and simulation. In fact, I'm working on my dissertation right now in modeling and simulation at the University of Central Florida. And um, I've, I have quite a long history in working on modeling and simulation programs for training um, for the Army specifically. Recently, I've been working with Homeland Security on um, various projects to leverage the work we've done with the Army to apply to uh, various tasks that Homeland Security is dealing with. So, for example, um, we built a simulation using a commercial game engine for uh, Homeland Security that helps uh, first responders deal with Uh, complex coordinated attacks, kind of similar to the Mumbai attacks that happened years ago, where you have uh, fire having to coordinate with law enforcement, having to coordinate with um, uh, medical support and things like that. So um, we built a a hotel and having, you know, the hotel was the soft target in Mumbai. And so um, we were able to leverage work we did for the army to apply to them. And it was very cost effective and very successful. And then we followed that up now recently with um, a school scenario. And the uh, interesting thing about the scenario is, for both of those scenarios, is that it's more of a sandbox than a game. So um, you don't have set scenarios. Things don't happen in a set sequence of events. The scenarios are all driven by live actors, just like in the real world. So um, if you want to train your first responders to deal with an active shooter, Um, You put an active shooter in and he behaves as a real person would behave, responding to the first responders um, activities. Uh, If you want to have two shooters, three shooters, five shooters, if you want to have somebody set fires or or put explosives into the environment, that can all happen. You can have just law enforcement show up. You can have law enforcement and fire. You can have law enforcement, fire, first um, uh, incident command, dispatch, all of these people involved in this scenario, just like they would be in real life. So it's very flexible. When It's funny because people always ask, how many scenarios are there? How many scenarios can you think up? Right. That's anything can happen. So, um, so it's very flexible. So I want to jump into some of this research because this is really interesting to me, especially because you're using a virtual environment mm-hmm. in order to um, simulate these types of situations where you need these massive coordination efforts mm-hmm. between multiple agencies and and various resources. Can you kind of go over some of the efficacy of using a virtual environment um, and and how that relates to real world and how it translates? So it's interesting that you say that because um, when you talk about efficacy, you can look at it from a couple different perspectives. Um, You can look at it from a training effectiveness perspective. Um, How do we know that training has occurred? Um, You can look at it from the perspective of how closely does it relate to the real event. So in other words, um, are are those muscle memories, so to speak, going to be uh, triggered um, in the simulation similar to the the way they would be in real life? Um, And what... This requires a little bit of discussion. So, um, sure, yeah, well, that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So, um, from the perspective of the muscle memory, absolutely not. It's a keyboard and mouse. Um, what we're hoping to do is is trigger this muscle memory, um, the cognitive processes they're going through. Um, we're not teaching them how to shoot a gun. We're not shooting, teaching them how to put out a fire. What we're teaching them how to do, or or mitigating their opportunities to learn, is communicate and coordinate and and work as a team in resolving this very complex situation um and as far as training effectiveness um 
It's very difficult to measure training effectiveness in a complex task like this. It's kind of referred to as an ill-defined task. So if you have a task that's similar to you know, uh, taking a gun apart and putting it back together, that's a well-defined task. There's a sequence of events that need to be done in, in a certain order. And uh, if one of them is not done, you can measure whether or not somebody's been successful. In a complex task like a school shooting or a, um, a Mumbai-type event, it's very difficult to measure um, success in different scenarios because everybody's activities are dependent on everyone else's. So you can't measure success by the numbers of bodies. You can't measure by the amount of time it took to, to take somebody down. The real training occurs after the scenario happens. So um, I'll, I'll talk about something that you're probably familiar with, and I, and I don't mean to um, suggest that you're gamers, although I suspect you might be. <laughs> may or may not be. <laughs> you probably have played Fortnite once or twice. Maybe. Oh, this guy's all about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so in Fortnite, one of the things that's really powerful and fun is after you finish your scenario, you can go back and do a playback, right? And show your buddies, oh my gosh, look at this double shot I got. Or where did these guys come from? I was going through this area. I had no idea where they were. And, they, and you can go back and see where they sniped you from. So that's very powerful. When you go back, and we actually use the same game engine that Fortnite uses, Unreal 4. Okay. Um, and when you go back... And you do the playback and you see somebody going through and doing something that's not according to protocol, their own protocol. The game doesn't suggest a protocol. They have um, trainers on site that can say, this is not protocol. Why did you do this? In the playback. That's where the real training occurs. So mm -hmm. we go through this scenario and we say, you know, here's what you were supposed to do. Here's what you actually did. Now let's go back and do something similar and, and retrain it. So you get this opportunity to relearn and relearn until you get it right. And just to be super clear for our audience listening, um, who is really the target audience right now for simulations like this? Okay, so specifically the school, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Because the school shooting scenario, we're targeting first responders and teachers, educators. Because in most cases in, in a school shooting, by the time the cops arrive, yeah, it's, it's over. Late. Right. So we want educators to know what they can do and to practice different strategies. Because sometimes they get very, you know, there's the run, hide, fight strategy, which is very common that educators are taught. Um, and unfortunately, they're taught it in a linear fashion. If you can run, run. If you can't hide, if you can't fight, right? It should not be linear. It should be continuously decided upon. So in each scenario, in each moment of an event like that, they need to know that they have those options available. So in the simulation, we try to make as many options available as possible. For example, they can barricade the door. They can lock the door. They can go out the windows. They can, and the really neat thing about the simulation is it allows the educators and the law enforcement and basically anybody to control the AI, which is the students, the artificial intelligence, controls the students. The students, you can tell them to hide in the back of the room, and some of them won't. Some of them will panic so much that they won't move. Um, you can tell them to go out the windows. You can tell them to follow me. Um, so there's a lot of control over the AI that's, that's really interesting in the game. And if two adults or two people are telling the children two different things, obviously they're going to be torn. Right. I was going to ask about sort of the different virtual agents that are in play mm -hmm. in this as well as who are the who are the people and how many people are embodying the avatars in this virtual environment that's a good question so um we've we can play around 40 people in the environment so um, simultaneously simultaneously okay. you can jump into the um scenario as a child and be a shooter you can jump in as an adult and be a shooter. You can also have non-kinetic or non-shooting events. So, for example, they might have a scenario where the teachers get to practice how to deal with de-escalating a non-custodial parent, for example, that comes in and wants to um, collect their child. And they now have the opportunity to, to practice these skills of it's okay, we're going to work this out, um, rather than escalating. So there's a lot of different ways you can use this. It's not purely in kinetic events. Um, but back to your numbers, how many people can be in there? Um, we have administrators, school administrators. We have um, the school safety officer, SRO, um, who's, who's able to play um, law enforcement. Um, even you can have parents pop in as, as players. So wow. it's a lot of flexibility depending on what you want to train. And like I said, the numbers vary. Um, 
but you know, based on your scenario, but we can support up to about 40, 50 people. Wow. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around all that. That's, that's really cool. And I'm kind of nerding out about all yeah, this. Yeah, it's really yeah. fun and interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible, sad, terrible subject. Sure. But you're providing an ability to potentially av- avoid it in the future being so horrible. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, the whole opportunity is to make people think. And, and what's interesting is when you're working with law enforcement, they're very comfortable working in this kind of scenario where there might be any kind of event happening. Educators did not self-select into events like these. They want to be educators. They don't want to have to protect their students or, or deal with shooters. Um, and so they have to, we have to kind of adjust the simulation to some extent for them. So for example, we kind of ramp down the gore factor. We, we kind of minimize the, we don't want to shock them into the point where they're right. not learning. We want to keep their brains engaged and thinking about what they're doing. It was interesting, a couple of weeks ago, we were, um, I won't say where we were, but um, we were at one of the sites that we were doing training and the educator uh, walked up on a fight between two girls um, and one of them pulled out a gun and shot the other one. And the educator honestly thought that she had reacted very quickly. She turned around and went to the intercom, the PA system, and she announced to the school there was a shooter. I'm sorry, before that, she told her students to get out through the window. And she went to the intercom and told everybody there was a shooter, and she was shot in the process. But while she was standing there looking at this girl who pulled out a gun and shot the other girl, she stood there shocked for a moment. She thought she reacted like that. But when we did the playback, she was stunned at how long it took her to see what was going on and then react to it. So there's almost like some perceptual lapse in, in temporal <laughs> awareness. Exactly. Right? That- well, you don't realize when, when something happens in front of you that's shocking and you think, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. You don't realize how how, how long it takes your brain to wrap your mind around things, yeah. Sure. So that gave her that opportunity to say, okay, so, so now I know what I might do in a situation like that. Hopefully it will never happen to her, but right. she's experienced it in a safe environment now, and she can, she's can she been able to practice it, and then go back and review how she handled it. Can I ask, who who plays the role of the active shooter in these situations? Is it is it an, an actor that knows kind of like a script? or I mean, I know you said, like... Uh, these scenarios don't really have bounds, but do they, uh, are they a trained actor to where they can? That's a really good question. So um, this is a training event. And so when you plan the training event, you plan exactly what you want these people to learn. So for example, you would have this as part of a training event. So you'd say, uh, you'd set up in the morning, um, I'm going to train you on these tactics, techniques, and procedures. And then you'd have a plan on, I want to have them practice this particular tactic. I want to see them perform when they'd have to deal with this kind of threat. And then you would get somebody like maybe a law enforcement person or you'd get a, a, one of the trainers to play that role so that we can exercise that particular skill. And they'll ramp up or ramp down. For example, in the hotel, it's a very difficult um, challenge in the hotel because the whole front of the hotel on two sides is all glass. So law enforcement approaching the hotel is very um, threatening. It's very challenging when you have an active shooter inside. So when we're trying to do a training event, often we'll have the, um, the people who are playing the role of the active shooters ramp down to let the law enforcement kind of get their feet under them, understand how to use the simulation, and then um, once they get that, then they can ramp up and make it a little more challenging them for them. So, so the players that are playing the threat are very, a very important role. If they overdo it, if they get too aggressive, they're going to make training difficult. But if they focus on what the tasks are they want the people to train, then it will be a positive experience. So one thing that I guess I get a little concerned about, and I'm sure you guys have thought about this, right? I know where it, you're going. <laughs> yeah, is, it, it is amazing that you're doing the work that you are to try and provide scenarios so people have had some kind of experience mm-hmm. with this, but it sounds like a lot of it is is very virtual-based. I mean, mm-hmm. is there any... any I, I know in the literature it's not very high, but I know even even with people in the military and the army, you'll see that sometimes you have people that freeze in hard situations, like you just mentioned with the administrator, mm-hmm. kind of not realizing they took that few seconds. Mm-hmm. Do you see any way through virtual environments or continuous training to kind of overcome that issue? Because hopefully nobody ever has to be in these positions, but right. you're you're doing the work to make sure that if they are here's the things you can potentially do. Right. As a matter of fact, there has been research that shows that you can desensitize a person to some extent 
um, by having them practice. Um, I couldn't cite the research right now. On the other hand, you can also induce PTSD if people have been in similar situations, so you have to be very sensitive to that. Virtual environments, now, now mind you, this is not VR. This is a keyboard and mouse. Definitely. Right. Um, so it's not as realistic, for example, as it would be if you're fully immersed. But it still is very traumatizing. It can be anyway. So um, you're right. We have to kind of um, stay within the bounds of not being too overwhelmingly realistic and at the same time providing enough realism that they're thinking through and, and hopefully stressing them a little bit so that they can think under pressure and experiencing it over and over again so that when there is actually a threat they've been there and done that and they and they can you know think through it more clearly so i know we're running short on time and i don't want to open a whole nother can of worms but just to satisfy my curiosity (laughs) i guess what kind of information and requirements go into creating a simulation are there like what kind of targeted um what, what things are you looking for when you're developing these simulations? That's a great question. So we sat down. <clears throat> actually, it was, it was very challenging because many of the development team have children um, that are in schools. Um, we sat down and we studied many school shooting scenarios. And we even sat down with one of the mothers from Sandy Hook who had made it um, her focus in life to learn about the event in great detail. Her child was, was killed and, and it was... Um, it was amazing how she was able to push past that and, and learn about the event so that other people could benefit from it. So we um, took the learning that we got from those events and we tried to make sure that the environment supported any, for example, um, in South Florida, the, simula- or the uh, event involved pulling a uh, fire alarm. So we tried to um, make sure that there was that capability in the simulation to allow the fire alarm to be pulled and to confuse people. Are we going to go out in the fire alarm or are we going to stay in our, our classrooms? So, um, so what we've done is just tried to make sure that each of those possibilities is something we've modeled in the environment and that that will allow for this flexibility of um, scenarios. So if that makes sense. So it took us weeks to really iron out what we... First of all, you have, in every simulation, you have your want list, your Cadillac want list, right. and then what you can actually do given the funding. So um, I think we, we met a nice middle ground of um, meeting a wide range of, of possibilities and still staying within our funding. This is super interesting, and I'm very excited for this talk. So well, thank you for the opportunity I, to talk about it. It's, I this just, has been great. Yeah, really. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Tammy Griffith, if our listeners want to follow uh, some of this research, where can they go? Well, I'll provide you a website, and um, you can put it up in the notes. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, Tammy, to end the show, we usually say it depends because it human factors everything. It depends on the So, count us down, we'll all say it depends Perfect. All right. Three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.